In 1980, the price of rolled steel started to fall. With worker pay tied to the selling price, wages dropped in conjunction with dispositions, threatening the record profits of CEO and philanthropist Andrew Carnegie of the Carnegie Steel Company. Despite Carnegie publicly supporting workers' rights and being pro-union, when the general manager of his steel plant in Homestead, Pennsylvania, Henry Frick, wanted to cut worker pay, Carnegie supported him, writing, We approve of anything you do. We are with you to the end. Their three-year contract with one of the largest unions in the U.S., the Amalgamated Association of Iron and Steel Workers, was coming to an end in June of 1892, meaning they would have to negotiate a new one. Knowing workers weren't going to be happy with a pay cut, after already taking one three years earlier, a strike seemed inevitable. So Carnegie and Frick sought to dissolve the union. Until the time came to renegotiate, they pushed workers to produce as much steel as possible. A good businessman milks the cow dry before they send it to the slaughterhouse. June arrived and union leaders ended up conceding on nearly every matter other than their disillusion. But it still wasn't enough. Frick wanted to break their solidarity. On June 25th, 1892, Frick announced he would only be negotiating with individuals and not with the union. Being a vocal pro-labor CEO, the workers wrote to Carnegie seeking his support, but he was on vacation, unresponsive to everyone except for Frick, writing back, this is your chance. On the 29th, Frick closed down the open hearth and armor plate mills, locking out 3,800 men. He had a 12-foot high fence built around the plant topped with barbed wire. It had searchlight towers and peepholes for rifles. Only 750 workers belonged to the union, but 3,000 agreed to strike. They sealed off the town from strike breakers and dubbed the place Fort Frick. Deputy sheriffs were sworn in to man the fence with rifles, but though sheriffs and their families lived in Homestead, the steel workers were their neighbors. Instead of attacking the strikers as they were instructed, the deputized sheriffs laid down their arms and went home. Rumor spread that Carnegie and Frick hired the famous strike-breaking Pinkerton detectives. Armed with sticks, rocks, and muzzle-loaded guns, the striking workers and sympathizing citizens patrolled the river running adjacent to the mill in preparation for the arrival of the Pinkertons. On July 6, a tugboat towing two barges filled with 300 Pinkertons carrying superior Winchester rifles shored on the bank of the river. The Pinkertons were warned not to exit their barges, but they did, and combat ensued. Rocks flew, followed by bullets. Nobody knows who shot first. The Pinkertons retreated to their barges for cover. The strikers were outgunned. As the Pinkertons cut rifle ports in the sides of their barges, the workers made barricades on the shore and searched the town for anything they could use to help them in battle. A local hardware merchant donated his entire stock of ammunition that the strikers carried to the mill in wheelbarrows. They rolled a flaming freight train car at the barges, tossed dynamite to sink the boats, pumped oil into the river to set it on fire, and even acquired a 20-pound cannon. But their attacks fell short and did little in damage. Four times the Pinkertons raised a white flag and four times it was shot down. By 6 a.m., over 5,000 spectators lined the riverbank. The battle lasted 12 hours and nearly a dozen people died. At 5 p.m., the workers accepted the Pinkerton surrender, but their victory was short-lived. At the request of Frick, the Pennsylvania governor sent 8,500 National Guard troops to Homestead, armed with the latest in rifles and Gatling guns. Knowing they were outmatched, the strikers surrendered, the mill was secured in 20 minutes, and Homestead was placed under martial law. By mid-August, it was fully operational with 1,700 scab workers, many of whom were black men with little opportunity for employment. It was the age of Jim Crow, after all. They were Pennsylvania's first black steel workers. In November, a massive race riot broke out. 2,000 white striking workers attacked the black scab workers and Homestead's 50 black families. Gunfire was exchanged, and many were severely wounded. Life worth living again, Carnegie exclaimed to Frick. First happy morning since July. Carnegie and Frick successfully swept unions out of Homestead. They slashed wages, imposed 12-hour workdays, and eliminated 500 jobs. Their profits rose to a staggering $106 million and effectively ended steelworker unions for 26 years. Oh, that Homestead blunder, Carnegie wrote a friend, but it's fading as all events do. And we are at work selling steel one pound for half a penny.